Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we're going to be looking at the presentation of financial statements, which is the IFRS 1. This topic is covered in an international accounting course as well as the CPA exam. As always, I would like to remind my viewers to connect with me on a professional level via LinkedIn. If you don't have a LinkedIn account, I strongly suggest you create one. It's very important for your professional image and networking capability. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube, please do so. I have over 1,500 lectures, accounting, auditing, and taxation. Also, please like my lectures if you like them, share them, put them in the playlist, let the world know about them. If you benefit from my YouTube, there are other people out there who might benefit as well. Please share the wealth. This is my Instagram account. I'm trying to grow my Instagram account. This is my Facebook handle, and I do have a website and some premium material on Gumroad. So let's talk about the presentation of financial statements or IFRS 1. In September of 2007, the IASB published a revised IAS 1. So hold on a second. Am I talking about IAS 1 or IFRS 1? Well, every time you hear the word IFRS, it means this is coming from the IASB, the International Accounting Standard Board. Every time you hear the term IAS, it's International Accounting Standard Committee. Now remember, the IASB replaced the IASC. Therefore, when something is revised and they, they either revise it or they accept IAS, it becomes IFRS. So if I say IFRS1 or IAS1, IAS1, it, mean, it really means the same thing, but the proper terminology now, the current term is IFRS. S1. Okay, so this IFRS1 provides guidance in the following area. First, it tells you what's the purpose of the financial statement. And simply, what is the purpose of the financial statements? Is to provide information for decision makers. Who are the decision makers? Creditors, investors, suppliers, government entities, anyone who's interested in your information. It talks about the components of financial statements. It talks about the overriding principle of fair presentation, what's considered fair presentation, accounting policies, basic principles and assumptions, as well as structure and content of financial statements. So as always, when I have a list, I'm going to go over each comp component of this list. The first component is pretty straightforward. Forward, what's the purpose of the financial statements? To provide information for decision making. Okay. The second component is the component of financial statements. What is considered a complete set of financial statements? Well, think about it. When you think of financial statements, what do you have to have? Well, we have to have a balance sheet. We have to have an income statement, statement of cash flow, statements of changes in equity, and remember, we need the notes because the notes, they will explain what's in the financial statement, explain the numerical figures. Also in the notes, we have significant a summary of significant accounting policies and other assumptions, any judgment we use to prepare the financial statements. So this is complete. This is considered a complete set of financial statements. So you cannot skip any of this, any of these components or they might have some, some components, uh, for example, comprehensive income. Just want to make sure you are aware. So this is what's com considered a complete set of financial statement. What are the overriding principle of fair presentation? Well, in other words, when should the financial statements be considered fairly presented? Well, financial statements should, should, shall present fairly with the financial position, which is the balance sheet, financial performance, which is income statement, and cash flow of an entity. Fair presentation require faithful present representation. What does it mean, faithful representation? It means truthful. It's actually what happened. It shows, it shows the effect of the event and the condition in accordance with the definition and recognition criteria for assets and liabilities and income and expenses set out in the framework. Now, we did not cover the framework. We're going to be covering the framework in the next session where we define assets, how is assets defined, how is liabilities defined. But what we're trying to say here is without knowing, knowing what the framework is, is the presentation of the numbers should be in compliance with the framework. If this is the definition of an asset, what we're looking for is an actual asset, not something else. It represents the actual event. If this is a revenue transaction, it's actually a revenue according to the framework. But generally speaking, as long as we are in compliance with IFRS, that's considered fair presentation. So simply put, what's considered fair presentation? Be in compliance with the IFRS, which is also you have to be in compliance with the framework as well.
Okay. Now, in extreme situation, okay, in rare circumstances, when management conclude that compliance with the requirement or standard might be misleading, that is, it would conflict uh, with the objective of financial statement set, set out in the framework, which is to provide information, you can depart from the requirement, but you have to have extensive disclosure. So let's assume you are treating a transaction a little bit different than when the, what the IFRS is asking you to do. If you happen to do so, and there must be a really, really good reason to deviate from the rule, from the framework, to deviate, to deviate from the IFRS. If that's the case, you have to give disclosure. Also, if local, if the local regulatory framework, if there's a local regulatory framework, for example, in the US, we do have our own, own framework, will not allow departing from a requirement. If that's the case, disclosure must be made to reduce the misleading aspect with the compliance with the requirement. So simply put, if for any reason you have a local rule that's 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 not allowing you uh, to comply with IFRS, it's it's you want to depart from the requirements. That's fine, as long as you disclose. Again, it has to be like kind of th there must be a good reason. Okay, just because not because you chose to, it must be a good reason why you are not complying with IFRS. Okay. Accounting policies, what are the accounting policies? Remember who select accounting policies? Management. So management should select and apply, management should select and apply accounting policies, again, in compliance with the IAS standard and all applicable interpretation. So what does that mean? It means when you select a policy, make sure it's in compliance with the IASB standard and interpretation. Now let's assume a guidance is lacking on a specific issue. So what should you do? Well, you should look for guidance and other ASB standard dealing with similar issues. So maybe you should uh, um, uh, contact the uh, the, inter uh, the advisory board of the IF IFRS uh, just to ask them, you know, you know, this is a new issue. I'm not really sure how to comply with this issue. Do you have any additional guidance? You can, you, you can contact the IFRS interpretation committee and ask them, you know, how should I deal with this? Because there's no really clear guidance. So you, you as long as you refer to the IFRS, you should be in good, you should be in good, in good shape. Okay. Also, you could look at the definition, recognition, and measurement criteria in the framework for the assets, liabilities, income, and expense. So the item that you are dealing with, it could be an asset, a liability, an income, or an expense. Look at the framework. And how would you interpret the framework? A, a IASB framework. Now you might be saying, you keep mentioning this framework. What is this framework? You're going to see it in the next session. It's basically it sets out the basic definitions of the financial statements elements, the qualitative characteristic of financial information, which we'll see this next. So you could look at the framework. Your third option is pronouncement of other standard setting bodies and accepted industry practices to the extent, but only to the extent that they don't, conf they don't, that they are, they don't conflict with A and B. So A is the uh, IASB standard. B is the framework. So you could look at maybe your local standard, but as long as they don't conflict with the IASP standard or the framework. Okay. Now bear in mind, this is not a hierarchy, but usually this is how it should be. IASB first. And within IASP, you could say I IASC because they kind of they go together. Then if that's the case, if that's if you cannot find your answer, you could look at the framework. Then you could look at maybe interpretation, um, the interpretation interpretation committee. Then you, you can look at the other standard setting bodies and accepted industry practices. Okay. Please note that individual country gap may be used also to fill in the blanks as long as they consist with the IASB standard and the framework. So if I'm if I'm if I'm in the US, well I can use US GAAP as long as US GAAP don't conflict with the IASB and the framework. The next thing we're going to look at basic principles and assumptions. Basically what what accounting principle do we use? Well, hopefully we know this. We're going to be using accrual basis of accounting, not cash basis. What is accrual basis? Accrual basis means you recognize revenue when you actually earn it, that when you receive the cash and you recognize expense when it, it is incurred, not when you pay it. So you're not using the cash basis. Also, we have the going concern assumption. And what's the going concern assumption? The going concern assumption means that we assume that companies will exist forever. And that's why we have, we look at the long-term um, 
long-term perspective for the company. That's why we depreciate asset. That's why we amortize premium. That's why we amortize discount because we assume the company is a going concern. We assume the company is going to be there. Um, also, we have to be consistent, consistency. And we're going to look at these concepts a little bit more in the framework. Consistent, consistency means we have to use the same information and we have to provide competitive information uh, principles found in the framework. Basically, consistency and comparability goes hand in hand. If you are consistent and applying the same principle, then your financial statements are most likely uh, comparable. Why? Because you are using the same uh, the same concept. You're, you are comparing apples to apples from year to year. Also, uh, another assumption, immaterial items should be aggregated. If we have immaterial items, we can add them all together. Assets and liabilities Income and expenses should not be offset and reported in net amount. So there's no such thing as offsetting. We don't offset them. What's going to happen? We're going to list them unless it's specifically permitted by the standard, which is it's very rare. It's a rarity. So simply put, no offsetting is allowed. No offsetting is allowed. The structure and content of the financial statements, the IAS one provide guidance with respect to current non-current distinction. So basically you have to have current liabilities, non-current liabilities, current assets, non-current assets, except when the presentation based on liquidity information. What does it mean when the presentation is based on liquidity information? It means the company is, gonna, is going out of business and we are liquidating. Therefore, the this classification does not make any sense. But on a day-to-day -day, day -day business, we have to uh, report the uh, current assets, current liabilities, long-term as non-current assets and non-current liabilities. Okay. It also tells us what items need to be presented on the face of the financial statements. And we'll learn about these items as we go throughout the course, what needs to be on the face, exactly on the presented on the face of the financial statements. What are the minimum requirement disclosure? What are the minimum requirement disclosure that we have to put in the financial statements? On the income statement, profit, before tax must reflect either a, na the, a nature of expense format, which is the one that's used in Europe, or a function of expense format, the one that's mostly used in Anglo countries. So either way, either method is good, the way we present profit before taxes. Also, IAS1 exclude something called extraordinary item. Simply put, I know in the US we used to have extraordinary item as an item on the income statement. IFRS don't use extraordinary item. Simply put, we don't use it. It's excluded. It's FYI, something you want to know about. So this is basically a brief overview of IFRS 1. Now, the next thing I'm going to look at is the I I IASB framework, which will kind of fill in the blanks. What is the framework every time they refer to this framework? And as we go along the course, this IFRS 1, because it, it's, it's basically an overview of the financial statements, things will start to make sense what is required to be disclosed, what's not required, what's minimally required to be disclosed. If you have any questions about this topic, please email me. If you happen to visit my website for additional lectures, please consider donating. If you're studying for your CPA exam, as always, study hard. It's worth it.